Good morning, this is Michelle Warner with the Mission Committee and I have a few announcements for you this morning. The Flu and Pneumonia Clinic is scheduled for Sunday, September 27th from 8 to 11 a.m. Sign-ups are required. For questions and sign-ups, please call 279-4622 and press 7 or email by September 25th. The proposed Memorial Garden expansion drawings are available for review. The drawings are posted by the newly cleared area beside Burt Lewis. And lastly, the 25th anniversary of the pumpkin patch has been postponed until next year. We will have a vir virtual story time that will be on our Facebook page as well as other activities for the children of St. Bartholomew's as well as the groups who have visited our patch in the past. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Let us prepare ourselves for worship.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Using the form found on page 79 in the Book of Common Prayer or your worship booklet, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say together the Venite, found on page 82 in the Book of Common Prayer, or your worship booklet. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The psalm today is Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8, and will be read in unison. It may be found on page 801 of the Book of Common Prayer or in your PDF. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great kindness. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, 
Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Let us say together Canticle 9, found on page 86 in the Book of Common Prayer or your worship booklet. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion. Ring out your joy, for the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, and for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us say together Canticle 16, found on page 92 in the Book of Common Prayer, or your worship booklet. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. 
He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We all may disagree on a lot of things, but I would imagine that most of us can agree that there are few things as cute as five-year-old soccer. If you've ever had that experience of watching five-year-olds play soccer for the first time on a team, you know that the rules of the game are different for five-year-olds. I will always imagine watching my kids at that age and seeing them learn to play this, this game and myself learning as well, learning that 
watching five-year-old soccer is no fun if you don't adjust your understanding of how the game of soccer is to be played. I was surprised that as a parent watching my kids play a team sport for the first time, I was surprised by how competitive I felt as I watched them play their games. I wanted the team to function well together and efficiently. I wanted them to increasingly grow as a team in those areas so that they could win. (laughs) But they did not seem to share that concern. They didn't care too much about all of that. If they forgot which goal they should kick the ball in, or if they accidentally stole the ball from their own teammate, or if they bumped into one another and they all just fell over in a pile laughing, That was just fine with them. After a while, I learned that I needed to adjust my way of thinking to theirs. If I was to, uh, if we were all going to enjoy this experience. I had to let go of my understanding about the strict rules and order of this sport. And when I did that, I found that the whole experience was so much more enjoyable. The great thing about five-year-old soccer is that at the end of the game, each player is valued regardless of whether she or he scored a goal. And if the child, of course, is is called to continue with this sport, it doesn't mean that there's not room for improvement as they get older, that of course will come. But at this time, at this stage, performance is not the reason to get out there. What's important is that they did get out there. They tried hard and they had fun. And the best thing I remember about five-year-old soccer When someone, after his first game, asked my son who had won the game, I remembered the puzzled look on his face. He had no idea what to say. They all had won. There are different rules to the game. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus describes a similar dynamic of there being different rules than we expect different rules than we are used to. Jesus tells us that although the world would have us believe that we must constantly compete for scarce resources and that our value is in how successful we are at competing for those scarce resources, the world would have us believe that that is what's important. But Jesus says in today's reading, that the reality is, in God's economy, there is an abundance. If you remember all the way back to early August when we saw Jesus breaking the loaves and the fish, over and over again, he wants us to know that there is more than enough for all. He wants us to know that regardless of anything we can do, we cannot earn God's love because it's already a abundantly given to us. His grace and his love abounds to us. And he is like the parent watching five-year-old soccer, just delighting in us. To illustrate this point, Jesus tells us a story. And in this story, we're told about an owner of a vineyard who calls workers to the vineyard at various points of the day. At the end of the day, those who had worked from the beginning of the day get paid the same as those who had only worked for an hour or two. Can't you hear them, the ones who had worked the longest, crying out, it isn't fair. And can't you imagine Jesus' disciples shaking their heads about this story and about how it was going to make them and Jesus look to the larger crowds who Jesus was speaking to. 
We can sympathize with the protest of the workers in the story. And I imagine we can sympathize with the disciples as well, who maybe were embarrassed by this story. But Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like that. What can this mean? What kind of justice can Jesus be portraying here? How can God be like that? And what kind of economy is this? We all know that the world doesn't work that way. The economy, of course, is based on the exchange of goods and services according to certain rules. But it seems that in God's economy, there is something more than that. It's hard to get completely comfortable with God's economy. And I think that's largely the point that Jesus is getting at. Because in our economy, each person knows where she stands. You do work, and you are compensated accordingly. But in God's economy, all are valued irrespective of what they can accomplish and irrespective of what the world thinks is important. Living in that tension between the world as we know it and the kingdom of God as described by Jesus is exactly where he wants us to be. It is the tension we all pray, or we all feel when we pray on earth as it is in heaven in the Lord's Prayer same tension that we feel when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus wants us to see that despite all evidence to the contrary, there is an abundance. An abundance of starting with God's grace and love for us, demonstrated in what God does for us by coming to save us, to give us this kingdom of God that Jesus speaks about today, that he embodies, that he demonstrates most fully as he lives and dies and rises again for all of us. There is no scarcity. Seeing the world that way changes everything. We can step out in faith as Jesus does and experience the fullness of a life lived generously patterned after his. The people in Jesus' parable would not have glossed over the Lord's prayer at the line that says, give us this day our daily bread. For them to be hired in the morning meant that they and their families would not be hungry in the evening. So they lived as the reality is that there's so many in our world today still live this way. They lived in a world in which anxiety was the common experience. The anxiety of every morning, whether or not, no, the anxiety of, know, of not knowing whether or not there would be enough, whether there would be food for the family. And beyond that, of course, there was the psychological pain of feeling undervalued by society. Imagine what it feels like to be hired late in the day, knowing that you are going to go home almost empty-handed, children going to bed hungry. That is the anxiety that is the con behind the, the parable that Jesus' original hearers would have fully understood. In the picture that Jesus has painted, there is scarcity all around. We would think that, of course, the employer would give more to those who have worked harder and longer. This is just common sense. But to our surprise, the landowner does not seem to see a world of scarcity. He does not base his life on the common sense of what the world would say is fair. Instead, the landowner makes generosity 
his fundamental principles. The rules of the game for the landowner have changed. They are based on God's love, not on ultimately on performance or perceived benefit. Everyone can go home. There is enough for the entire family at the end of that day. There are different rules to this game for all of us, Jesus says. And most of us listening to this sermon, I would imagine, thank goodness, do not have to live with that kind of anxiety that so many in our world have to live in. The anxiety of standing in line before dawn, praying for this day our daily bread. And yet, whatever our situation, we are all in such great need of God's compassion and generosity. And we are given so much more than we could ever ask or imagine, not because we deserve it, but because of the grace of our God. And it is that compassion and generosity that we experience with one another. It's that compassion and generosity that forms the basis of our Christian community, that forms the basis of life at St. Bartholomew's, the, the initial reason for being a, a church. We are playing in a world that expects certain things, but which we know has diff- a game that has different rules. We know that the community that Jesus was originally talking to included people who had only recently come to his, we know that there were the original 12 disciples, but we also know that at various times there were smaller and larger groups that also followed Jesus. So imagine how when Jesus tells this parable about the last being first and the first being last, how that would have, re- would have resonated within that community. There must have been some who felt that they deserved greater treatment and privileges because they had been there from the beginning. Jesus says, not so among you. Then imagine the early church, those who, who gathered around, uh, who originally gathered around Christ, and then when Jesus left, how the church rapidly grew and spread throughout the world. Again, this story, they must have come back to it over and over again about the last being first and the first being last. It doesn't matter, in other words, whether or not in our church, we, our great, 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 great grandfathers or grandmothers started the church, or if the person came yesterday. All are equally loved and valued within this community. Because the truth is, no matter who we are, we are all hungry for God's grace. All just as much in need of it. We are all just as much in the position of the laborers, equally in need of God's generosity. Once we realize that the rules of the game have changed, that God is good despite us, that God is so generous even even though we have no reason to expect it, we may not be experiencing living one day to the next. But, But we know that there are those who still are, have not, who have not understood yet about God's grace and generosity. And so we are called forth to share that good news, whether it's in inviting people into God's reconciled community, and so that they too can experience that amazing generosity and grace, or whether it's in the people reaching out to the people who we know are in physical need, like those laborers, 
we ourselves may not be in that position, but we know that there are people who gather this morning and every morning at food banks and North Augusta and Augusta, that there are people who have in desperate need because a hurricane just hit the Gulf Coast and any number of other things. And so when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're not only praying it for ourselves, we are praying it for, the, for those as well, for a world that desperately needs to know God's generosity. Those people who are going to the food bank or the soup kitchens in downtown this morning are hoping that there will be volunteers and food. They are hoping that we have heard this parable this morning. How could we who have been given so generously not be generous ourselves with others? Like those who cry out in the parable, it's not fair. The temptation is for us to assume that we deserve what we have, that we deserve God's generosity. The temptation is to believe that God operates according to what we think is fair. But what wonderful, great good news that God's grace is so great that it is given regardless of anything we could do. Thank goodness that God does not operate according to what we think is fair. Thank goodness that our God is so perfectly generous and gracious. God has given us new rules to this game. And like the parent watching the five-year-old soccer, God is cheering us on and delighting in each of us. Amen. Let us affirm our faith, saying together the Apostles' Creed, found on page 96 in the Book of Common Prayer, or your worship booklet. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us say together suffrages B, found on page 98 in the Book of Common Prayer or your worship booklet. Save your people, O Lord, and bless your inheritance. 
govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. And you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. The Collect of the Day. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those things that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A prayer for the parish. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear the prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A prayer for mission. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. your prayers of thanksgiving and, and intercession either aloud or in the holy silence of your hearts. Prayers for the mission committee and the staff and of St. Bartholomew's for all the leaders here for discernment during this time of transition. For Bishop Waldo and the entire diocesan staff. We pray also for the victims of Hurricane Sally.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us say together the general thanksgiving found on page 101 in the Book of Common Prayer or your worship booklet. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. is king. 